And as I said, sheep don't do well among wild animals. They need a flock. They need a shepherd. And the same holds true today. Titus was to appoint leaders because there were people in the church who were being disruptive. Whole families were being upset. And Paul's solution was not to just talk to them, but to have authority over them, much more authority than what was there originally. Apparently, Titus was not able to go to every single church and solve every single problem. So leaders needed to be placed in those churches who knew correct doctrine, who knew what needed to be done, and were the right people. So these, these empty talkers could be stopped. we got to remember that, too, at this time, that each, home, each church met in a home. They, they did not meet in a church building like we have here. So if, if there's a problem in a home, and you, they probably had anywhere from 25 to 30, maybe 25 to 30 people, if there's a problem, if people are upsetting other people in that little space, it's, it, it creates a problem in that home, and whole families were being disrupted. There were two groups of people, actually, that Paul was concerned about. The first group he calls empty talkers. These people may say a lot, Really, they don't say anything. I was going to show you a video. There's actually, this is actually an art where you can go in and you can say, you can talk to this person and you can ask these questions. These questions have no meaning whatsoever. And believe it or not, the person will answer you. Saying, yeah, that sounds about right. There's a man, um, I think he's from Canada. He mastered this. And it's actually some of the, some of the tools that many of the false prophets today that are in the churches that are in the, many of the Pentecostal churches that they use. They talk about all kinds of things that make no sense whatsoever, and people are like, oh. But it's just empty talk. If you're interested in seeing the video, I'll send you the clip. I'll, or you can email me or let me know, and I'll, I'll send you the clip so you can see it. I didn't want to take the time to watch it, because you've got to watch the whole thing and see that he's actually saying nothing, and everybody just agrees with him. These empty talkers... Now, the Greek word is actually one word for empty talkers, and it's a word, it's, it's a beautifully rich word if you know Greek. And it's mateo lo, lagos. Mateo lagos. Empty talking. They peddle big words, vaporous content. You might say they're big winded. <laughs> I think they were probably politicians. I don't know, maybe. Big words, little content. Senseless talking will lead to senseless thinking. Paul warned Timothy himself, actually warned Timothy in another place about these same kind of people. He says in 1 Timothy 1.6, he says, Certain persons, by swerving from these, have wandered away into vain discussions. Discussions that have no purpose. Now, there are parts of theology. There are parts of... Of the Bible where we read it, and it's important for us to discuss them because of the words, because of the language, because of the context. But there's a whole lot of things in this world that are just empty talking. Just go on social media, and you'll see a whole lot of empty talking. The Cretans that Titus is having to deal with put on a really good show. But at the end of the day... There was no spiritual benefit for anything that they were saying. And what was sad was when that happens in the reality, instead of talking about, instead of talking about Scripture, talking about God's Word, they're talking about empty things, and those things take the truth from those who listen to it. They sound impressive, but their words are intended to boost their own egos. And Paul's solution for these people was to silence them. His, his goal, he wanted to silence them completely. He didn't want them to talk. Because these empty talkers would lead people to another group. And this other group that Paul speaks about are those who are deceivers. 
Now, unlike the empty talkers who said nothing while saying a bunch of stuff, these deceivers would say things that had substance to them. But it was a false substance. And Paul's solution to these deceivers was to rebuke them sharply. See, the problem with these two groups is that the reality is they are rejecting authority. They're rejecting the authority of Jesus Christ, and they're rejecting the authority of Paul, and, and who Paul put there, Titus. And when they do that, they, they, they enjoy controversy. I used to know someone, they just loved controversy. Even if they did not believe the opposite side that somebody was discussing, they would automatically take the opposite side just to stir up trouble. Because they believed that if you stir up trouble, you'll get to the truth sooner or later. The problem is, when you stir up trouble, you start to create emotions. And when we get emotional, we don't think straight. When we get extremely offended and angry, we are, our minds are no longer in control. Our hearts are, and we'll find out later how deceitful the heart is. The term that Paul uses for these peoples is the same word he used last week when he was talking about children who are disobedient to their parents. When you have an elder, they, the child needs to be obedient. The same word he uses for these people who are deceivers. So this task in front of Titus is extremely daunting. He has to deal with very difficult people. And Paul wants to emphasize that, you know, it, it, it's, it's a problem, but it's partially a problem because of where Titus is. He is on the island of Crete. And one of their own philosophers, and we know who that philosopher is that Paul is referencing because we have his writings and we see right in there he says the same thing that Paul says that he says. His name was Epimenides. I had to practice that word. Epimenides. He was a Cretan philosopher from about the 7th or the 6th century B.C. And Epimenides called Cretans evil beasts. Now, there was irony in him doing that because the island of Crete has no major predators. There are no mountain lions, there are no bears, there are no tigers. I don't know. I don't know what other what wild beast there might be. But there are no, 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 except for man, man being the highest predator, but there are no major beasts there. I mean, no dangerous animals, but the people actually would make up for the lack of the wild animals. And that's basically what Epimenides was saying. Now, Throughout the New Testament, believers in Christ, we are called, there's an animal that we are called to be. We are called to be sheep. Now, I've done sermons on being sheep. Sheep are not the most intelligent animals in the world. They easily wander off. That's why Jesus says he'll, he'll leave the 99 to go after the one because the one has wandered off from the 99. Most of us have a tendency to wander. We're not the most intelligent beings sometimes. Even the most smartest people in the world have some problems with common sense. And so, think about that. So now you have the church, sheep, in the midst of wild beasts. Not a good picture. Because the Cretans that were in the church were easily swayed by the people who were empty talkers and were deceivers. Like sheep to a slaughter is what they were. Peter was talking about this, that, that we are to be, we are sheep, but we are called that because, because we have a chief shepherd who is Jesus Christ, and leaders of the church are the under-shepherds. In 1 Peter 5, 1-4, through 4, he says, So I exhort the elders among you. So I'm, I'm, I challenge you, elders, as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed, meaning that I'm saved, I'm going to be with Christ when he comes back, shepherd the flock of God that is among you, Exercising oversight, not under compulsion, means don't do it because you think you have to. Do it because you're honored to. But willingly, as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly. Not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading fading crown of glory. He's saying, 
be a shepherd. These people are sheep. They will wander. You need to take care of them. And you need to do it willingly. And you need to do it lovingly. Like unruly children and wild animals, these people were empty talkers and deceivers. They, they didn't want any part of being part of this flock of the shepherd. Their way was better. They wanted to be a solitary wild animal doing their own thing. Kind of like today, I think that's a problem in our world. And as I said, sheep don't do well among wild animals. They need a flock. They need a shepherd. And the same holds true today. Now, today, there are many in the church who say, well, we just need to get along with those who don't agree with us. And that's partially true on things that really don't matter. But there are certain things that are <laughs> undeniable in Scripture that we cannot accept in the church. So we can't just get along. We need to stop them. If it's against church doctrine, we need to stop it in the church. But many churches and many denominations have just decided to, we'll just get along. We'll just accept it. It'll be okay. And watch the news, and sooner or later you'll see the problems that are occurring because of that. Paul would have none of that. And Paul is very consistent in what he tells Titus to do because he also told Timothy, he says, preach the word in 2 Timothy 4. Be ready in season and out of season. He tells him, reprove, which means go to them and, and show it to them. Show them the truth. Reprove them. Rebuke them is what he tells them. Also, rebuke and exhort, which means lift up, with complete patience and teaching. Don't go and smack them around. Don't kick them out of the church. The whole point of, of going to somebody when there's a problem is not to kick them out of the, the congregation. The point is to reconcile and stay together. So we do that with complete patience and teaching. When somebody, somebody gets mad at you, what do you do? Do you get mad back? No. You have to be calm. Let them throw their fit and then prove your point. Don't get angry. Don't lash out. Notice how Paul tells Timothy to rebuke with complete patience and teaching. So if you think about that, now we can understand what some of the things why Paul said that an elder must not be short-tempered, why an elder must be kind, why an elder must be willing to, to rebuke, but in a loving way. A leader who is not arrogant, quick-tempered, or violent would be more effective at correcting an issue than one who is angry, because that person who's angry and lashing out will not maintain the unity of the body. 